Hello and welcome to Crux Investor. First of all, thank you so much for watching this interview. We spoke earlier today with Roger Lemaitre, CEO of UEX Corp. They're a TSXV listed uranium junior with us assets in the Athabasca Basin. And if you want our feedback on that interview and conversation with Roger, you can get that at cruxinvestor.com forward slash club. You can also find company reports in there, training courses. Uh, you get commentary from market experts from all around the world. You also get early access to all of our interviews plus exclusive content and there's a thriving community of like-minded investors sharing their thoughts and ideas and if you go now you get a seven-day free trial we'd also like your feedback so don't forget to press the like button and leave your comments and if you look in the description below at some of the topics we discuss anything interests you in particular click the number beside that topic that's called a time something i'll jump you through to that part of the interview and if i could ask that you click the subscription button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our youtube channel and of course for more videos like this click the notification bell Roger, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. How about yourself? Yeah, good. It's been good. It's been well since we spoke. So um, I'm glad you picked up the phone. You're looking very dapper there, suited and booted. Have you been doing investor meetings or something? Uh, a certain, we're certainly seeing a lot more people calling us up unsolicited to talk. So uh, they seem to like uh, Fridays. So oh, boy. today's Friday. So I get to dress up for Fridays at a dress down. Why do they do that? They, they must know it's Friday. It's been a long week, um, but it's good, good to see you. So um, you've been obviously working hard on doing those investor calls. But if you don't mind kicking off, give us a one minute overview of the business for people new to this um, story, and then we can pick it up from there. So UEX Corporation, we're uh, one of the older uranium juniors in the space. Uh, we jumped into the Athabasca Basin way before everybody else did in the last cycle. Uh, and we have 10 uranium deposits that are, you know, poised to move forward into the next into the next cycle. But uh, we really think in the current environment that our strength in the mid short term is to work on our portfolio for new discoveries, because that's where, quite frankly, our we think the greatest value comes for shareholders and new discovery companies. Uh, and we have the lowest risk portfolio of opportunities in the Athabasca Basin in in where it's historically one of the lower cost of production jurisdictions. So. If you're looking for a portfolio with lower risk for expiration, uh, upside potential, but backstopped by uranium pounds that can be moved forward when the time is right, then UX is, is one of the few companies that can, can, can do both. And you kind of got the cobalt component there as well for when that comes back. But yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a chance for shareholders to get a little bit of extra value uh, when the market comes, but it's not our core focus. Right. I'm glad you said that. Okay. Remind me again, where, what's your back, background, your track record again? So I, I've been in the in and out of the uh, their majors and juniors for the last 30 years. Last 20 of it's been in the uranium sector. I spent uh, 12 years at Cameco, uh, running from as little or little, as from the very beginning of my my career there. I was on the exploration team that helped extend the rabbit or the, the rabbit lake Eagle Point operation with new discoveries in basement rocks, uh, where where we said they couldn't be found. We I moved on to to manage Saskatchewan exploration for Cameco, and I was on their mergers and acquisitions teams for a few years, and then managed their global portfolio of operating projects. Before I moved on uh, and uh, moved into back into the junior sector, uh, I think my claim to fame would be that every single major company I've ever worked for in Canada no longer exists, so except for one, and that's Cameco. <laughs> They've all been bought out. Right. I was about to say, where's that going? Uh, so it, it ended in a good place. Um, look, last time we spoke, and you know, like I do enjoy talking to you. I think you're an uh, absolute realist. You've got the track record, and you've been always very, very straight with us. So, uh, you know, I like I like these conversations. I think people who want to understand the business model can listen to you know the pre previous interviews. But last time we spoke, you'd raised a couple of million bucks. Um, what was the plan? Uh, the, the, the last raise was a little bit of what we call hard dollar financing in Canada because it wasn't a flow through. Uh, the idea was to help us do a little bit more work at our Christy Lake project that we were doing some drilling here. And we just started wrapping up that program as we speak. And to keep us uh, going through to the end of next year without having to raise money to, to keep the lights on. Uh, that, we had a little bit of money left over from our previous uh, flow through financing that was done uh, in uh, late November, early December. Uh, that was funding the exploration work for this year. And have, so have you really been, in that, besides that, we've been doing a deep dive into our Shea Creek project as well to look at the expansion potential that we've always thought has been there. And I think what surprised us is that it's far larger than we would have, the upside potential is much larger than we would have predicted. Okay, well, let's talk about that in a sec, okay? Because I'm, I'm wondering, um, again, I just want to help people understand your thinking here. You raised two million bucks. It's been a tough, 
few years for uranium, but there have been people going out there and raising raising capital, and it's more than just keep the lights on um, type capital. They've been looking at drilling and so forth. So if I look at some of your neighbors within the basin, they've raised a lot more money than you. I mean, why so little? Well, we're really conscious about shareholder dilution and the when till the market starts to move. Uh, in the right direction to, to, to fund larger programs, development programs, and whatever. So we kind of, when it comes to funding our exploration activities, we kind of look at it, uh, I wouldn't say we act like a major company, but we kind of look a little more planning and say, okay, in the next six to 12 months, what is it, what exactly do we want to do? We look at our portfolio, we look at the targets within the portfolio, because we look at targets as opposed to the projects within the portfolio and say, where do we, should we spend our best money? What's the market? Deal we should do and what's fairest to shareholders that are currently in the in the company and so we'll raise two million uh three years ago we raised six million because we were drilling off the deposit um and it just depends on what's what's urgent for the company what's best for shareholders we have literally turned away six or seven million dollars in the last couple of weeks because it wasn't the right time uh, we're just entering our cycle as to what we're doing in 2021 and how much we need to raise, and we'll, 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 we'll size, anything that we do in the future is always gonna be sized from what we're gonna do in the next few months to, to 12 month window. So we could raise more money, it doesn't necessarily benefit shareholders. It's, in, it's interesting actually that there are funds now looking at putting money into uranium again. I mean, it seems to be sort of happening quietly in, in the background, because you suddenly, you know, you may hear these announcements coming out, people have raised, you know, five, 10 million bucks, et cetera, and you, you kind of wonder on the basis of what? I mean, your share price is now around sort of 70 million bucks, which is obviously great, a lot higher than when we, I think, last spoke. Um, the, the, the spot price has risen and fallen back again to the $30. Um, it, there seems to be a real kind of disconnect in the in the marketplace between what utility buyers are doing, what explorers are capable of uh, of doing, and and um, you know investors in the market are kind of, I guess, confused at the moment. I mean, that, that, I mean that's the it, truth, yeah. right? It's been like that for a while, for sure. It's it's a confusing market. It's not as you know, you hear people saying it's not transparent. There's, there's very little doubt about the lack of transparency in the market. And when we look at things, spot price is a great short-term trigger, but you know, pretty much every pound of spot purchases eventually worked its way into a utility contract somewhere in the future. So demand is always going to be driven by utilities. And utilities have been for the last couple of years sitting on the sidelines waiting for things to, to, to work through as, as the overhang that was in the space seems to be being eaten away and now they're working into into their uh, inventories um, but quite frankly uh, uh, we said last time they are always believing that there's an endless supply of cheap uranium to be had out there and in many years they're correct um, but when it changes it changes pretty quickly and I think they believe until we see what happens post-covid with the big players that are out there with sort of or with longer term contract capacity um, they wait and see whether the market is tighter than you know you have utilities saying the market's not tight and you have suppliers saying the market's tight the reality will show up in the, ne in, the in the next few months and i think it's the, the next few months is more of not the bang it's going to change instantly uh, world it's more of okay here's the first step among a few to get us to where the uranium companies are going to be comfortable bringing new production on and, and supported by investors and, and, and future contracts so i don't think it's going to change in october uh, i don't think uh, in terms of radical step change it's a it's a small step in the right direction uh, but when it, it can be like a ripple and pond it just gets bigger and bigger as it moves, it moves outwards so we'll see where it goes that gives me a bit of insight into the why you've only raised two million bucks because you're saying you know i think the october uh, date you refer to there is the rsa um agreement uh, announcement hopefully it doesn't get extended again uh that people are looking to yeah. but that is, is that the reason it's 2 million bucks, not 10 million bucks? Do you think this first step forward is going to be first of many small steps required to move the market to a point where you're seeing it's a fair reflection of what you think you've got? Our RSA decision will help the American utilities make decisions about what they can do about procurement. Uh, I think, you know, post that, your next step is, okay, now we're out contracting. Can we find it if you're a utility? And what do we do if we can? And what do we do if we can't? 
and that'll be the step number two. And then it'll come down to what the volume is and, and whether or not there are utilities out there that want to be, you know, I don't think anyone wants to be first to jump in the pool. They all want to be second. They don't want to be last, but the question comes down to how urgent is that run up? And, and I think that's impossible to predict uh, from where we stand. You know, we don't buy and sell uranium every day. That's not what we do. Um, so we'll take our cues from, from some of the players who do do that. Okay. But you, you're slightly more cautious. You've got a, I'd go realistic, but you know, I'll be, yeah. use the word cautious. I'm, I'm in the junior sector, so we're going to be optimistic for sure. Uh, it will change someday. Is that October? Or is that a year from October? Or is that beyond? I can't predict that because it really does come down to, you know, um, you, there's a real, there's a real cash flow problem for companies that are selling and they need this, they need cash flow. So uh, it depends how desperate they are and, and how desperate are the utilities. It's going to be a tug of war. Yeah, t- tell me about it. I think maybe it's a conversation for another day and, and, and another topic because I think there's some com- uh, util- uh, uranium companies have done deals which are uh, terminal. Uh, but like I say, conversation for another 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 day. Um, they've taken the quick money, not the good money. Um, let's talk about your two uh, too many bucks and, and the rest that you've been spending on focus on two of your 10 assets. Okay, Christy, you've been doing some drilling and then I guess we'll, we'll, we'll come on to Shea Creek in a second. But so what's been happening at Christy and what, what do you now know as a result? So we, we were working along a trend of known mineralization. We have our three known deposits, Chris, uh, Aurora, Ken Penn and, and Paul Bay. And we realized last year that that trend was offset uh, potentially because we knew there was mineralization across the property boundary from our neighbor Cameco, uh, had drilled a hole that was of interest out there. Uh, and we, so we looked at the offset, we sort of got some geophysical imaging over the last uh, 12 months to tell us that we should be over here. We've drilled our first few holes into this trend and the whole purpose of this program, I mean, everyone would like to say, hey, uh, we're gonna make the next big discovery on the very next hole. And of course, we always hope that's the case. But for us, we have this kilometer and a half trend uh, that's got all the signs that we need to see uh, is it the right place for us to focus our next bigger program on? And that's really what it, it was about. I think we, fin- we finished that program. We're still waiting for the analytical results to come in. Uh, they were in uh, just a couple or in the last couple of weeks, and we don't know where we'll stand until we see the results back from that. But I, I would say that we're pretty happy with where we, we've got. It might not be, you know, obviously it's, uh, I can't tell you what the results are, so <laughs> until if their news comes out, but. Yes, it was a small program, it was only four holes. So we weren't expecting to make the next uh, 10, uh, 150 million pound discovery with four holes. Right, okay. You, you can smile or just blink in Morse code if it's good. <laughs> okay, um, Okay. well let's, let's talk about Shea Creek because I want to come, sort of come back to the overall plan in a second. So what's happened to Shea Creek? You seem pleased with that. So over the last uh, eight, nine months, we've been in the field looking at the old core uh, taking a bit of the knowledge that we have, you know, myself and, uh, and and some other members of our team have experience with with several basement hosted deposits like at Eagle Point and at Millennium and a few other places, and saying, okay, how come the bulk of the resource at Shea Creek is in the basement, yet basement mineralization hasn't really been looked at by the operator, which is Arano, and just taking a deep dive into sort of our structural understanding of how these deposits form and and why, you know, basically, um, are there within the footprint of the existing deposits? Are there chances to expand things? And so, our, our chief Joe is to deep, deep, deep dive into the records, the core itself, and 3D modeling. And we've actually been able to identify ten really high priority areas, but particularly two that really jump out at us as to why we should be looking for Kiana style deposits at Shea Creek. Kiana is one of the four deposits. That haven't been looked at. So we've been working, we've, we've dependified those for a modest uh, amount of money. We can go out and drill some holes. We, of course, have to get our partners' engagement on that at Arano. And, and Arano's have been challenged over the last decade financially. Um, and COVID certainly hasn't made that easier. So we're working with them to try to find a way to, we think it's probably one of the highest possibilities uh, in terms of growth anywhere in the basin for current resources because uh, that model's not been tested. So we, our goal is to grow that into the to one of the larger undeveloped deposits, it already is, but to make it even bigger. So okay, interesting. that's where we're going to be trying to focus for the next few, few months to get th- that rolling. I think um, Arana are, are challenged at the moment and distracted. They've got fighting fires on lots of fronts. Um, 
you know, so, so I guess that makes that makes life very interesting interesting for you. But okay, so you kind of described what you've been doing there, what the focus is. You're focusing on just those two, Christy and and uh, and uh, Shea Creek. Great. Um, you've got a limited amount of budget here. You must know when you're going to need to go and raise capital. And and I know, and I asked this not because oh, when's the next capital raise? There's a bit of dilution coming, but you must have a plan about how quickly you you develop things, given your view of what's going to happen in the marketplace. Because you need to know where you sit. You need to know where your business sits, where the where the um, the growth is going to come from, where the real the realization in the marketplace of what it is that you've got is going to be appreciated and be reflected in the share price. So there's no point going rushing out and doing a whole bunch of work if the market's not going to care. So what are those points that you're going to time your capital expenditure? Well, for us, uh, looking forward into 2021, I think the next month, uh, I will get our team together. They will go through our, we have a target inventory of, and say, okay, which are the things that we want to achieve? What can we get the best bang for the buck on as well? Because uh, sometimes the best targets, and we always go after our best targets first, are a little more costly than some of our shallow or targets like we have at Hidden Bay. And we rank them, make every one of those targets and say, okay, which one do we want to work on this year? We do want to do some work. I don't think we can sit here and say, okay, we're closing up shop for the next two years because that's what we think the market's going to change because um, everyone's been wrong for the last uh, almost decade now. So I'm not sure that that's really a realistic option, but we're not also going to go out and say, okay, we're going to spend $10 million worth of work this year and try everything we can to find a deposit that come hell or high water, essentially. Um, we have tens of millions of dollars worth of expiration targets, drill ready expiration targets that we can tackle. It's not responsible for us as a, our board feels it's not responsible for us to go out there and just say we'll drill at all costs, at any cost. So we'll have a, we'll put a proposal together, our board will look through it. And then, I mean, realistically, our 2021 program from a expiration execution point of view, we'll need some sort of funding and we'll have to decide whether that's a million dollars or $10 million or somewhere in between. And we'll be going out probably to look at that sometime in the early next year. So that's market market dependent. You'll take a view given Absolutely. how you think things are moving um, or if they're moving. We've had people knocking on our door, trying to give us money, but I'm not sure the cost of capital that's involved with those transactions are necessarily, I don't find them acceptable to shareholders today. So we're, we're, we have the ability to be patient. We have pretty much zero holding costs for all our assets. So we're not obligated to go and spend money if we don't have to. Okay, wise words. Wise words. Um, again, just c- c- coming back to the to the plan. I'm, I'm always fascinated by the plan. You've got a lot of assets, and we've talked about this in the in the past, both the pros and the cons. But I guess on the on the pro side of things, it gives you some optionality um, to offload some of them. Yes. Because what we're seeing a lot of in the market are new entrants. Some quite bizarre new entrants, but nevertheless new entrants where they perhaps haven't come from a uranium background, but they're seeing that uranium is getting noticed and they feel that they can build a company and promote around it. So there could be buyers out there if you need cash. Is that mm-hmm. is that in the thinking at the moment? Absolutely, and it has been for, for several years. Uh, the key word for us on all of these types of transactions is sustainability. I mean, that's the key word. It's not sustainability from uh, an ESG point of view. It's sustainability from a finance point of view. So we easily could have optioned off all of our non-core assets over the last couple of years and end up in a situation where we have stranded assets that can't be funded. So uh, we've decided because the cost to hold them was relatively small, we'll hold them until we can find partners that can absolutely, you know, sustain and answer the next one or two key questions on each of those projects. That we, we that we want to answer, and I think the, you know with more interest in the space, that's more po- that's definitely a lot more possible than it would have been a year and a half ago, where the industry, as I used to say, was sort of like having a leprosy. You'd call up a banker or something, and say, "Hey, I want to talk to you." And they go, "You're uranium. Oh, don't talk to me. I don't want to talk to you because it's, it's it's a dead space to me right now." Uh, that at least has changed for the industry, and, and then there's money being raised. And yes, uh, I think one of the advantages of our portfolio with our more grassroots projects. Is it? I mean, the discovery potential in the Athabasca is still pretty high. Uh, there's still a lot of a lot of potential for new discoveries, and those new discoveries tend to fit in the low-cost half acre, which 
of the cost curve if you made a discovery to move forward. I think you need to be, as a uranium investor, invest in a space where you have a possibility of bringing it towards production. Uh, and, and you can go and find cheaper assets somewhere else that don't necessarily, you know, didn't make the last run, uh, didn't make the last uprise, did one before that, or back going back to, to the starting of the entire industry, has been found early on, can't be moved forward in their tougher jurisdictions and hope that you're going to get something out of it. Or you can, you know, and if you just look at UX from, from the last run and some of our peer companies and their subsequent discoveries they made, then that's where the value creation is. So um, that's where we think we can help other companies go forward and help ourselves. Yeah, I, can, I guess like people wanting to build uranium businesses, they want to be in the right zip code and, and the Athabasca Basin does give you that. But let's remind investors how this works. You've got a bunch of assets. You've ranked from one to 10 in terms of quality. Which one do you sell first? Oh, that would be the that would be the biggest question. And I think it comes down to, quite frankly, the appetite of the people who want to participate. And so we we have the ability to okay, you're a uranium investor, or you don't have the technical expertise to do this. You can take on a, a higher or a lower risk project, but you don't have the skills. We can help you with that because we have the capacity to, to operate for you. And hey, you want to work on a project with three holes that are mineralized, never followed up? You could have one of those. You want a cheaper entry on a pure, pure grassroots play? We can give one of those two as, as, as well. I think the core four assets we have are probably not ones that we're looking to to move. Uh, although there is on one of our projects, there there is there are postage there are. There were targets within there that we would consider that a hidden bay for the right price, but the, the price of entry is a little higher, right? You want to drill a hole next door to McLean Lake Mine, well, you might pay a little more than than a grassroots project in the in the southwest corner of the basin that's far away from where the hot stuff is going. So it comes down to the app. It really comes down to the appetite. But the key projects, Shake Creek, Christie Lake, uh, and Horseshoe Raven, um, in, in, in key parts of, of Hidden Bay, probably not something we're going to move. Well, it's, it's the point I'm trying to make, Roger, here for people watching is you don't sell the good stuff. And if you do, no. you sell it for the right price. And that automatically puts the buyer at a disadvantage day one. What do you think? So if I may just segue away from that, just we'll come back to it. But what are you thinking? So there are quite a, a lot of uh, M&A uh, announcements coming out within the uranium space with projects which have been around the block. That, you know, we've seen them once or twice before. Um, what's your view? Do you, do you think it's possible for companies like that, junior, junior uranium companies, to build a business off the back of these sort of small, relatively low-grade um, projects? Ooh, um, I'm, I'm more worried not so much about the grade, about about the dollars you can make on the pro on the project itself. So yeah, I, I do think it's very difficult. Uh, ISR projects that are in the right directions obviously do well. We see, you know, 55% of the world's uranium coming out of the coming out of the ground that way. And a lot of it's low cost, but there are other ones that are very high cost. So projects that have been around and been through two or three cycles, those ones are hard, hard wins. Uh, you know, the, the the cost of being able to bring in something that's small, you, you run across the same permitting cost, you run across the same environmental cost, ESG cost. The hurdle becomes really difficult. Uh, and they tend to be in the low, in the, in the higher cost half. That's why they've sat. And I think to be to be successful in this business, you do have to be in the low cost half. So yes, you can build a bunch of assets you can get for very cheap uh, that you hope things are going to turn. And, and you're you know you have a very different strategy uh, if you're running a company like that. You're hoping that you're going to buy a portfolio that will be of interest to others. And uh, and and it's not others and better uranium investors. Another big company. And if you're in the uranium space. Um, you don't see a lot of takeovers of, of, of those types of companies uh, and, and that are successful going to the bigger players. You know, they've, they've had an eyeball on those for many years and they have a large portfolio or database of, you know, hey, do I like project A in jurisdiction B that's been around since 1970? They're less likely to move on that. You know, they're, they're very risk adverse as well. So they need to see that it's going to be a low cost half. So that's for us, that's why we focus the Athabasca Basin It's the place where you can. There are other jurisdictions where you can do that as well. But then they happen to be good investment jurisdictions as well. But, but yes, to, to the, you're going to put together 10 million pound assets and hope that you can put something together. That's going to be a difficult task. 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I don't know about you as a CEO and with your track record, when you sort of see these management teams putting these projects together, what, what are your initial thoughts? What, what, are, what are your concerns? Or are you just sitting there smiling? Uh, as a CEO, I, I get concerned about about investors and, 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 and funds being able to, to discriminate between both of those kind of plays and which ones are the quality because you know, when we saw the last run up, the space was was so dead for so long, nobody knew what was good or bad. And there were a lot of money, there's a lot of money poured into the space and, and it disillusioned investors. So I think what, what I worry about, well, it's been a decade and a half now since we were in the last run, uh, people have turned over and you can see that same thing competing for space. And, and uh, for, for, you know, some, I remember when there was 500 uranium juniors in your and you could you could make a great discovery and you was trying to get seen was very difficult because there was just a lot of noise. So the, the, that's the that's the part I worry about the most is being able to, to be able to be heard when there's a lot of noise and and yeah it's uh, it's a bit of a challenge. But I, but I also think that it disillusions investors when they don't get what they expect out of things that people promise what can't be actually achieved, and it and it creates it hurts all of the whole sector. So. I worry about those things. Uh, I worry about the competition for space um, because of the noise of things that I think even see some some of those companies will even go, well, yeah, I don't think that's this. And maybe the strategy is building blocks to get something bigger and better in the future. Um, that's going to be harder to do this time around than it was last time. Yeah, I, I hear you. I've, there's two sides to that. Obviously, as CEO, yeah, it's, there's a lot of white noise out there and it's hard to get heard when everyone's saying the same thing based on completely different fundamentals. Um, so it's slightly unfair. I, I do get them from your perspective. From my perspective, I, I'm looking at this from the number of people, and I think you alluded to it there, number of people who lost money in the last cycle because they bought the story the whole way up. And they didn't, and it was so long, you know, you know prior to that, I mean, it was sort of a long run, long bear uh, run as well. So. I fear that that's going to happen again, and some people will lose the show because I'm seeing bets being placed on companies which, you know, we we would not recommend or would not yeah. touch. So, um, I, I hope that, I hope your shouting from the rooftops is heard. Like a lot of like a lot of people, and people are a bit more cognizant of what is real and what is just promote. But I appreciate your yeah. insight. I think in the last cycle, Matt. Um, we were coming off gold, where gold companies were being valued on ounces in the ground and not so much their cash flow. And so there was such hype there that uranium companies got valued the same way. So creating pounds was 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 the metric between how people how companies were evaluated. And we're in and, and we followed a hot gold market then, and we're following the hot gold market now. But I don't think the gold market today, despite its its frothiness, is being valued on how many ounces do I have in the ground basis. So maybe that creates a, a a more realistic place for investors when they start to transition into other sectors and hopefully it'll be the uranium sector uh, where they don't value things just based on the number of resources you have in the ground but the quality of that uh, you have in the ground. Yeah, I remember I, I was one of those bankers. That's exactly how we did it and we, we, learned, we learned the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps we shouldn't be doing things like that. Um, okay, so let, let's come back to you. So I decided to drag it into the macro, but again, it just gives me a sort of sense of you know how, how you th how, how you think, which I quite like. Um, you are going to have to raise some money perhaps next year, beginning of next year, once you've kind of worked out what the market looks like and what you think you should be gearing up to do. Um, are you saying to me that you have no sense of what that quantum is yet? Just want to be clear. Oh, no. no, we definitely have a sense of that quantum. We definitely have a sense of that quantum. Uh, I don't. I think if you think we're going to come out and raise fifteen million dollars, that's probably highly unrealistic. Um, I don't think you can do a meaningful program that moves the bar and answers a question for less than a million. So we're going to be somewhere in the middle. I think what we did this year is probably as small as what we'd like to do. But to be honest with you, that's really that's really up to where the market decides to go with it. If the terms on on on, on picking up money don't change, then we'll do less. I mean, you mentioned earlier um, you're getting phone calls, inbound phone calls, uh, funds, banks offering you cash. I mean, what sort of capital are we talking about? What sort of charges do they think they can you know get away with? Well, I think it, it, it varies between for being came up with the flow through angle and the non flow through angle. Uh, but but oddly enough, similarly similar asks. So slight discounts to market with warrants with short term you know, or half warrants or full warrants with with a short or sorry a very long window 
to execute with a very short premium to the to the to the unit price. And uh, that one's that ones are hard. I mean, there is a every cycle is a you know changes. Those things were acceptable. We did one of those back in you know earlier this year. We did a half unit uh, deal, um, but it comes down to the you know. We're, we did it because one, that's what the market was demanding at the time, and two, the quality investors that we were able to bring into the space. So, you know, that I knew they were going to, you know, pretty comfortable with their long approach that they wanted to, to be in uranium for the long term, and they liked the way our story was going. I'm less keen to do that for people who are more willing to be in and out in two, three, four months, um, and they're looking for, for, you know, it's it's a great win for them to get the same terms that happened when the market was, was was much more risky spot that it is today yeah so yeah okay no thanks for that it, it, again it kind of plots a, a a mark in the sand for me because i was explaining to um some investors that kind of reached out and said well, you know why do some companies raise money at a, a discount and some get a premium and you know trying to explain the reasons why behind that but it, 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 it what it does do is allow you to sort of see where the market's at any one moment in time and certainly perception of that of, that, at that, of the company or that commodity at that point in time and i suspect if we come back and talk to you in um six to nine months we'll probably get a slightly different answer the market definitely varies day to day month to month week to week so yes uh, we're not we're not trying to drive the market in terms of you know we, we we're so much a different position than all our peers um but we're also at the luxury of not having to finance when we don't need to right now so um we don't uh, i don't think it's you know, to, to reach back to investors, offer the same terms back in, in, in that we were negotiating in April when the market was so much more uncertain than it is today. Uh, to people today is necessarily fair to people who came in then and existing shareholders before that. So, um, and then we could be wrong by that. We might turn around five months from now and go, well, maybe we should have, um, but I'm, we're willing to take that uh, opportunity. Okay, Roger. Well, like, nice, nice catch up. I know you're kind of cautiously advancing things. I know you're optimistic about the future as you should be, but um, cash preservation is also critical at this time until there's a bit more certainty. So uh, stay in touch, let us know how you're getting on. You've got some great assets there. Um, it'd be great to sort of understand more when you know more. So uh, pick up the phone. All right, thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much for, for talking to us.